Wine to Five is partially funded by Al Borello Luxury Hand Soap, an unscented must-have accessory for anyone who loves wine, cooking, and food. For more information, visit alborellosoap.com. It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five, entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Wine to Five. This is episode 79. I'm Val. I'm here in Colorado. And guess where our Steph is? Buonasera, Val. (laughs) <laughs> ah, buonasera. Ciao, bella. <laughs> Ciao. I am happy to say that I am Skyping tonight from my villa in Perugia. Yes, and it's a little bit cold, but today was a nice sunny day. Enjoyed going to Assisi, and now I am sipping on some vino bianco that we had just picked up at the grocery store the day we arrived, and it's, you know, standard Umbrian House White Wine. Uh, this one is a 2015 Lungarati Torre di Giano. It's a blend of Vermentino, Grecchetto, and Trebbiano. And uh, I would be happy to have this as my house wine back in Colorado for five, a little over five euros a bottle. That's pretty good. God, I miss grocery store wine, man. Yeah, I mean, it was they, they had a great selection. And even... The um, Scotch Diavoli uh, Sagrantino 2008 that I bought was only 20 euros. What? <laughs> what? Yeah, eight year old, right? Eight year old. <sighs> I decanted it last night. It was really delicious. So, yeah. Are you having Damn some it. breakfast wine over there or is it uh, wine with lunchtime? Well, now it's lunchtime because we were having our guest interview this morning. So I have switched from half-calf coffee to tea, and now I've got a lunch wine here. Nice. And this is this is a wine that actually was violated back in uh, June. It was tasted originally back in June when I was studying for my exam. And so I had my Coravan, and I had about 18 bottles open. I love when you say violated. I mean, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because you, what you're doing, for those listeners who don't know, you have this Coravan device, and it punctures the cork of the wine and lets you just pull out one glass so you don't have to open the whole bottle. So when you're opening a couple hundred dollars worth of wine at a time, you don't want to just waste this wine or have a Save Our Livers party like we used to in the past. I've had this wine, like I said, I was it was tasted one time back in June, and I was able to open the bottle today, and it's drinking just fine. And so this is the Sterling... This is a 2013 uh, Napa Valley Cab. I do regret that I don't have any of the Gurgich Hills wine on hand because that's who we're talking with today on today's show, Steph. Isn't that exciting? Oh my gosh. She really knows how to deliver. I'm going to give a little bio here on our guest, Violet Gurgich. For anybody who doesn't know the name Gurgich, that is Gurgich Hills Winery in Napa. So Violet Gurgich is the co-proprietor and she is the vice president of operations and sales. Let me tell you a little bit about Violet, and then you're going to really get to know her in the interview. Violet's passion for wine began at an early age as she literally grew up accompanying her father in the vineyards and cellar. She spent her summers at the winery doing everything from bottling line work to laboratory analysis and working in the tasting room. Attending the University of California, Davis, Violet earned a BA in music, while taking classes in biology, chemistry, and enology. After graduation, she returned home to Gurgich Hills to continue her education in the wine business, learning about daily operations from the winery from Mike. She received her Master's of Music in the Harpsichord at Indiana University and then joined the winery full-time in 1988. She's now responsible for daily management of the winery as well as sales and marketing. She says that she has the ideal job, which we talk about in the interview, and she says, quote, I believe that wine is part of a healthy, happy, and long life. Wine brings people together and makes them happy, which makes my job extraordinarily fulfilling, unquote. 
Violet is involved with every aspect of the wine business. Violet enjoys wearing many different hats, often at the same time. She explains, quote, My dad insisted that in order to lead the winery, I needed to work at every single position, starting at the bottom, unquote. Violet continues to enjoy learning something new each day and following her grandfather's and father's philosophy of, quote, every day, do something just a little better, unquote. Violet is pleased that the next generation has joined the winery. Son, born in 2005, accompanies her on sales trips and enjoys every minute of it. Now for your audio pleasure, our interview with Violet. We are here today with Violet Gergich from Gergich Hills Winery. Welcome, Violet. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And Violet is the co-proprietor of Gergich Hills and the vice president of operations and sales. So, Violet, tell us what makes your job the ideal job? Well, first of all, I am surrounded by vineyards. And uh, I'm associated with wine. So immediately that can tell you that it's a pretty fabulous job. Um, It's also something that I've grown up doing my entire life. My father uh, has always worked as a winemaker. And when I was really, really little, he would take me to all the wineries that he worked at. Mm -hmm. So I got a chance to go to Robert Mondavi. His office was actually in the tower. So for a little three-year-old girl, it was absolutely the most fabulous place in the world because it was like in a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, as I got older, he worked at Chateau Montalene. I had a beautiful uh, cave and cellar to play on and a great Japanese lake. Uh, and then at Gurgit Hills, I was a little disappointed that there wasn't uh, as much history here, but it was also exciting because it was brand new ground that we broke. And so I actually uh, was able for our groundbreaking on July 4th, 1977, to pour a bottle of the 1973 Montalena Chardonnay my dad made that won the Paris tasting into the corner of the winery. And uh, from that day, I've actually been working here. So I started pretty much doing everything, Uh, started on the bottling line, uh, worked in the cellar, worked crush. Uh, Once I graduated from high school, I actually went and studied music at UC Davis, but I kept coming back home to work. And, uh, you know, eventually I decided it was something I really wanted to spend my time doing. So, you know, for me, my absolute favorite part of my job is meeting people and having them tell me stories about how much they love our wines, what our wines have meant to them in their lives, and how amazing it was to have met my dad either 30 or 40 years ago or last week. So um, it really gives me great joy because we really made a difference in people's lives. You know, I love hearing the stories where people got engaged over a bottle of Chardonnay and Then there was a story where a gentleman uh, couldn't get this gal to go out with her for months and months and months. And finally, he sent her a bottle of our Chardonnay. And she's like, ah, he has great taste. I I guess I better go out. (laughs) Many, many, many more stories like that. But that's probably truly the, the most wonderful part of my job. Well, you know, and you're a part of, of Napa or actually California or American wine history. I mean, where your dad got his beginning when he came over here in the 50s to make wine. And he's he's an historic figure in the American wine heritage. But he's also got that new book, A Glass Full of Miracles. Could you tell us a little bit about that for any of the listeners who haven't heard of it? Well, you might have to... Um... Stop me from talking because I tend not to speak a little bit about the book. Okay. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, called, it's called A Glass Full of Miracles. And uh, for many, many years, I was absolutely convinced that my dad's story would not just be a great wine story, but the story of a great human being. Um, because, you know, whatever he did in his life, he would have succeeded you know, it's truly rags to riches. I don't know how much you or the listeners know about him, but he was born in a very small, very poor village in Croatia, which was part of Yugoslavia at the time. And he grew up stomping grapes and making wine and eventually uh, was the first person in his family to get beyond the eighth grade and studied viticulture and enology at the University of Zagreb, which was the capital of Croatia. Um, he actually ended up having to flee Yugoslavia 
because the secret police were after him. The whole story's in the book. Mm-hmm. You can certainly read it. Um, but he went to Germany, uh, to West Germany, and actually worked there for several years on a farm while waiting to get a visa to America. Um, American visa did not come, but he did get an offer from Canada to go mm-hmm. to the Yukon and become a lumberjack. So he thought, well, you know, Canada's next to America. It will at least get me a little bit closer. So uh, he went, and it turns out that the person who was supposed to meet him at the train station never showed up, and he ended up becoming a dishwasher instead, uh, eventually becoming quality control in a paper mill, and uh, after some time, found his way uh, to Napa Valley, which was where he'd always wanted to go. The reason he wanted to go to America was because he heard it was a land where you can actually achieve your dreams. And he worked with a number of famous winemakers, uh, Andre Chelichev from Blue Vineyards, Robert Mondavi, as I mentioned earlier. And then he was one of the partners and winemaker at Chateau Montalena. And all the other winemakers, uh, the other partners wanted to make Cabernet Sauvignon because they felt that it was the great red wine of Bordeaux and the greatest wine in the world. And they felt this way until he actually showed them uh, projections for the next five years and the fact that there would be no income. They had no idea that actually making Cabernet costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. So he suggested that he make Chardonnay, which is the great white wine of Burgundy, which is equal in complexity and longevity to Cabernet, um, but you can actually start selling it and get cash flow. So if he had not suggested that, there would not have been a 73 Chateau Montalena Chardonnay, which went off to Paris in 1976. And it was entered in this competition, which was organized by Stephen Spurrier, who was an Englishman in France trying to basically get some promotion for his wine shop and his wine school. Turns out the professional French judges picked his Chardonnay to be better than the best of the white burgundies that were there. Warren's uh, Vignarski Stag's Leap Cabernet won the red portion. But my dad's Chardonnay was the highest scoring wine in the entire tasting, basically winning the tasting and putting Napa on the map. So, you know, there's a lot in the book about this event, um, but also about how he starts the winery in 1977 with our partner Austin Hills from the Hills Brothers Coffee family. And um, really, it's an amazing story of rags to riches. Um, and so many people who've read the book have told me that it's, it's not only kept them up at night, but it's made them cry. So, you know, for people who love wine, it gives a lot of history about winemaking, great stories about the early days of the Napa Valley. And, of course, he tells all about how he made that famous 73 Chardonnay. But for me, the really important part is just his amazing humanism and the hard work and the passion that he had and that belief in himself and setting a goal, never giving up. So... I find it to be very, very inspirational and a book really for everyone to read. Children, grown-ups, whether they know anything about wine or not, it will make a difference. It sounds sounds amazing. And, and, you know, Violet, when you and I met at the Women of the Vine earlier this year, you were telling me uh, a little bit more about The Judgment of Paris and the film that's coming along. Uh, about your dad's story. Tell us how the uh, the film is um, coming together. Well, um, we'd like it to be a little sooner in production, but uh, it's been taking a long time. Uh, the script was originally re- uh, written by Robert Mark Kamen, who uh, wrote The Karate Kid and The Taken Trilogy and a number of other things. And he was writing it and finishing it at the same time that Bottle Shot came out. And so once Bottle Shop came out, which um, is mostly fictional, I don't know if most people know this, um, very few of the things that actually are portrayed took place, um, including, including the actual wine turning pink. But um, he got very uh, dissuaded, and it took him a long time to actually um, um, find some further funding. So a few years ago, he found a wonderful uh, gentleman who agreed to help uh, produce the movie, Jonathan Rotella. And so they've started things back up again. Uh, They're still looking for investors in the film. Um, And at the moment, number one priority is finding a director. So they had uh, recently been working with Andy Tennant. Uh, Apparently they had creative differences, so he is no longer uh, the director. 
Um, but they're working with Weimaraner Republic Pictures. Um, the owners of that uh, was the head of Warner Brothers. And they're working for looking, again, for possible directors. Once they have directors, they can do a cast. And then the idea is to start filming, home, hopefully, in the summer of 17. So oh, we're really okay. hoping for a release by the um, summer of 18 or late fall by 18. And uh, that's actually the true story of the Paris tasting. It's based on the book Judgment of Paris that was mm -hmm. written by Mr. George Tabor, who happened to be the only journalist who was present at the tasting. And in fact, if he hadn't been there, nobody would have heard about the tasting because um, there wouldn't have been any um, uh, third party there to witness it. Of course, nobody would believe Stephen Spurrier if he says all the French judges <laughs> picked, you know, Napa Valley wines to be better than theirs. So we're really fortunate that he wrote the book. Um, the book, however, focuses mostly on Warren Vinyarski uh, because uh, Bottle Shock already got filmed. But uh, Robert uh, fell in love with my dad so much that he actually started adding bits of him in the movie itself. So, so far, the, whole, the only portion of the movie that's been filmed is the scene my father actually ends the movie and talks about his life and his achievements, and they actually filmed that last summer, and that will be the end of the movie. So, you know, I don't know if people start with the end of the movie first, but I feel like there's no better way to end a movie about the judgment of Paris than, than with my dad. It's like eating de dessert first. <laughs> So that's actually where I heard your father's or read, I should say, your father's story the first time was in the book because they do mention or he does. Steven Spurrier does mention in the book about your dad coming to the train station and nobody was there to meet him. And his story was part of, again, American wine history. So for those of us who didn't enjoy history growing up, we found that the study of wine has really <laughs> inspired a, a learning about history. I don't know if I'm saying that right. This half calf coffee is not doing doing me well at all. <laughs> but um, but the one thing that we've talked about um, your dad before and the grapes mm -hmm. that originate in Croatia. And actually, we did a seminar on Croatian wine, and I had to look up how to pronounce poship and plavich mali and <laughs> and all these <laughs> all these things. So this brings me to the next question in a roundabout half caffeinated way about is it Gergic Vina? Gergic Vina. Gergic yes. Vina. Also Croats would say Gergic. Gergic. But yes, exactly. Oh bravo. So that's our name as spelled in Croatian. Uh, the H was added to make it a little easier for Americans to pronounce. No extra vowels because they're not needed. Um, the <laughs> accent on the C actually gives it a CH sound. Mm -hmm. So, and it basically means Gurich wines, Gurich winery. And that's why it's Plavich Mali and not Plavik Mali, like I said on the show once. Exactly. Well, it's actually Plavats, which is Plavats. a little harder to pronounce. It's like a TS sound at the end. And uh -huh. uh, that's the one that really gets most people. Every letter in Croatian alphabet is pronounced exactly the same all the time. Makes it really easy. A lot easier than English. Right, right. Yeah. And so for those listeners that may not remember that episode where we talked about the Who's Your Daddy grapes and the Zinfandel and the Zinquest, this is, uh, well, they say Michael Gergic, but his real name is... Miljenko. Miljenko. Okay, so Miljenko. Right. So he <laughs> actually is instrumental in discovering that Zinfandel actually originated originated in Croatia, like we talked about in that episode. And now you've got this, this gorgeous property there where you make these wines from these native grapes. And could you tell our listeners a little bit about what it's like going there, what you love about the property, or even the wines, which I, I tried to get my hands on some at your website and they were gone, some of the Croatian <laughs> wines way back. But um, could you tell our listeners a little bit more about these? Absolutely. Um, this is, again, another one of those things where I tend to go on and on about because it's such an amazing place. Once Croatia declared independence, my dad felt it was safe to actually return to Croatia. And uh, he actually had a meeting with the president and uh, asked him, so what can he do for this, this new democratic country? And he said, well, what do you do in America? And my dad said, well, I make wine. So he said, well, make wine here. So the building that he actually found for the winery 
uh, he got with the help of the government, and it was actually a military building right on the coastline, um, built out of beautiful rocks. If anybody's seen any pictures of Dubrovnik or Split or the Dalmatian coastline, you know that most buildings are made out of these big stones with red tile roofs. So this beautiful building is on the peninsula of Pelyashats, which is renowned for its um, appellation called Dingach. Dingach is the most famous one. That's the one with the steepest slopes. And then Postup, uh, same grapes grow there, Plavitz Mali. Uh, it's just not quite as steep as the others. And he found this ideal place and started making wines there in 1996. So two wines, you mentioned both of them. Poship is a white wine. The grapes are actually grown on the island of Korchula, which, if you are not familiar with this, uh, Marco Polo was actually born. Uh, most people don't realize that Marco Polo was Croatian. Uh, that's because the island of Korchula had been um, uh, taken into the Venetian Empire at that time. So, technically, uh, by nationality, he's Croatian. Wow. So those grapes, yeah. So those wonderful grapes are associated. It makes a beautiful, very fragrant, but rich white wine. Um, every time I try it, which has unfortunately been way too long since we're out of it here in America, but it reminds me of actually sort of sitting there in front of the winery by the sea, smelling mm -hmm. the cedars and the lavender, wonderful salt spray, and getting this beautiful aroma of grapes and flowers. So it's wonderful wine. And then Plavitz Mali is the variety that he thought was the original Zinfandel. And it turns out that Plavitz Mali's parent, Sir Lienak, is the original Zinfandel. Uh, still makes Plavitz Mali a wonderful grape, similar to Zinfandel, but a little bit more rustic in style. So make a beautiful, big, red, fruity, um, beautiful, silky tannins. Just gorgeous, gorgeous wine from that, which is really an incredible food pairing wine. Um, we try to bring these wines into the United States when we can. We are unfortunately out of them at the moment. Um, but eventually, maybe given about another year, they'll be available from uh, the winery here at Gurgic Hills. Now, the winery in Croatia, Gurgic Vina, does see visitors. It's a tiny little place, um, but it's open to the public. And uh, there's you can uh, email info at gurgich vinacom or email me here at the winery for info, and I'll be happy to send it along. That's great. Gotcha. And how often do you get over there, Violet, to visit? It's about once a year or so. Um, it was a little less frequently, but once our son was born, I wanted to make sure that he had a chance to spend time with relatives and speak Croatian with actual Croatians. And uh, the one year we didn't go because uh, we were a little too busy doing so much traveling, he was very, very upset and every day made a point of being mad at me and telling me to book our airplane tickets right away. So uh, he loves it very much. He's 11 years old right now and, of course, um, has some fantasies about working in the wine business while being an aerospace engineer. Oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, um, uh, let's go move to a different topic here because I know you're also very passionate about music. And tell me, what are your thoughts and feelings about music and its effect on your wine experience? Oh my gosh, that's that's quite a loaded question because I I know that many things tend to you know become trendy, but this is truly one of those things that is real. Um, same thing with food and wine pairing. Most people don't realize what food and wine pairing means until they have the absolute perfect combination, and then they get it, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, anything that we experience actually affects the way that we taste food and taste wine. So whether whatever it's something that you hear or see will definitely affect that experience. So because, you know, music can be described in a lot of the same kind of adjectives that wine can. It can be dark. It can be light and bright. You know, it can be really zippy and fast. Um, it can be cheerful. It can be sort of just sort of joyous. Um, so many of these same words are used to describe music. And so given the combination, if you pair them the right way, you're mm -hmm. also going to get that kind of experience where both, where either of them are just so much incredibly better. So as a musician, I like to make a lot of analogies with wine and with music. Uh, you know, wine is not just a science, but an art. 
as is music. But I like to, you know, our wine has a very special kind of style. It's not, our wines are not overly big. They're not made to knock you over the head and to immediately impress wine critics. Uh, they're made to really draw you in and to become more and more interesting and complex the more you experience them. So that's not just in one sitting. Let's say you start with a glass of wine at dinner and several hours later, you're finishing the bottle with the end of your dinner. That wine will have transformed, transformed from beginning to end. And it will just continue to get better, more harmonized, more complex. It's like, you know, people have their favorite pieces of music and they listen to them over and over again. And every time they listen, they hear something new or something different. Same thing with great movie, movies, uh, great literature. There's always something more that you get from experiencing something that's great. And that's the kind of style that our wine is. So... I think it's one of the reasons that I've been able to drink my dad's wine since I was um, almost since I was born and still not get tired of them because they do have that ability to transcend um, just the basic components of what that is. Yeah, well, you two can't see me right now, but I'm bobbing my head at like everything you're saying because I really like how you put those descriptions together. It was just like, yes. That is it. <laughs> yeah, totally. I also have a great appreciation um, of things like Warner Brothers cartoons and um, especially early cartoons. Those were made not just for kids, but for grownups. And so the older I got, the more I saw was actually in them. And so I'm a big fan of having things that are accessible to people on all levels. So our wines just taste good. If you know nothing about wine, you're going to enjoy them. But the more you know the more you enjoy them and the more you get. So it's not it's not wine for one kind of person. It's wine for everyone. And, and that's what makes wine inclusive. I think there's so much mm -hmm. out there that, that almost makes wine appear exclusive. It's only for the rich. It's only for this person. Or you're only a wine lover if you like this kind of wine. Right. And it's really unfortunate because people's tastes are so different. Mm -hmm. Even professionals can have very different tastes and also opinions as to what is good. You know, it's like it's like a movie review. OK, so maybe, you know, the movie reviewer and you love everything that they love. Well, there might be movie reviewers that whatever they hate, you know, you're going to love. You know, not everyone has the same opinion. And because it's art and because it's something that you personally experience, your opinion is just as valid as anyone else's. So, you know, we come from peasant stock. You know, my father had no money. Um, his family had no money. Um, he grew up making wine and experiencing uh, wine with no, you know, every day of his life. But he also has an amazing palate. And it, you know, he didn't have to have money to have it. So I think it really is about finding what you like at your price point and being certain of that. And, you know, what you like can also change. You know, the more you try, the more knowledge you'll have about what you appreciate and what you don't. And sometimes trying things that you might not necessarily like, but you can appreciate that they're well-made, that's a really wonderful thing to have, too. I think at some point, you you know, in your wine development, you start sort of figuring that out. It just sort of happens one day, like, oh, I think this is a really well-made wine, but it's not to my taste. There's a few flavors I don't like about it. You know, and that's absolutely fine. That's part of education is to continually learn. My father was told by his father to every day do your best, learn something new, and make a friend. And so he has abided by that, I think, every day of his life and has told me countless times. And, of course, I got tired of it when I was younger. But now the older I get, the more I keep repeating it to my son, my husband, employees, everybody. Because it's just a wonderful way of living one's life to the fullest. Well, Violet, what, speaking of doing your best, uh, we know the movie is is coming out or they're going to start filming in 2017. For the future of Gurgit Hills, what do, you, what do you see beyond uh, 2017? Wow. Well, I see a very long future. Um, my father was one of 11, um, my mother was one of seven, and they managed to have one child. 
I have only one child, but um, he is uh, very much interested in science, in business, in selling things, and uh, in uh, really achieving his potential. And so I'm excited that he's excited about the family. We also have my cousin, Ivo Iramas, who is responsible for production and winemaking and vineyards. He's a little bit more productive than I am. He has six children. And uh, the youngest is about my son's age. And his oldest daughter is working in our tasting room and starting to learn about export sales. Her name is Maya. And uh, many people who've been to the tasting room, if they've been taken around by Maya, had a great experience. Um, also, Austin Hills has a son, Justin, uh, who spent an amount of time in the vineyards and also in the tasting room where I think, you know, people might remember having met him and heard his stories. Uh, he's now uh, selling wines for us in the San Francisco area. So it's uh, we've got a lot of uh, family that is actually happy to continue to work and take this project on. You know, we are happy with all of our vineyards. We have five acres. We don't plan on purchasing anymore. We don't plan on selling anything. Uh, we just, can, you know, are working on continuing to improve quality. We farm everything naturally. Everything is um, certified organic. And, you know, we've heard about global warming as well. We have vineyards in all areas of Napa Valley, from the warmest to the coolest. And uh, we've done some, you know, planting. We had Chardonnay and Rutherford. We ended up planting that to Cabernet a number of years ago. So as long as we have our land and as long as we continue with our wine style that we're known for, that consistency of that balanced, incredibly elegant wine, we have a great future. In fact, this next year, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary. That's July 4th on 2017. So that actually means I'm older than 40 because I've been working at the winery since 1977. But it's a wonderful thing, you know, to experience and know that, you know, as you're getting older and gain more experience and, and hopefully wisdom along the way, that you have members of your family that are that are coming up. My father always talks about legacy and the fact that he sees himself in a line of Gurgitches uh, extending far beyond into the past and far beyond into the future. And that his goal is to uh, take what he has and maintain and improve it and pass it on to the next generation to continue that for hopefully ever. Nice. That is exciting. One more thing, though, to switch kind of gears again. We love to ask our guests to share something funny, like an embarrassing wine story. And I think that, you know, there has been some really touching great stories and and conversation today do you have something to end this interview that really kind of just gives everybody a little bit of a laugh (laughs) well I probably have way too many funny stories but um, probably my favorite one is about speaking in public so I don't know how familiar you are with my father, but he is probably one of the greatest speakers I've ever heard, either live, on television, in movies. He is truly amazing. And I have always been horrendously, painfully, debilitatingly shy. And uh, my dad used to, you know, I started off in the vineyards and then in the cellar and in the laboratory. And I was really happy as long as I didn't have to talk to anybody. But, you know, if I did, it had to be on very serious subjects. And uh, my dad was like, nah, you need to get out a bit more. You need to learn how to sell wine. So um, after, uh, you know, embarrassing myself on a number of different occasions, I remember my first trip to New York and I was giving a presentation in front of a group of New York sommeliers. And I showed up at the venue and the hostess there, uh, who was much taller and and just stunningly beautiful, uh, sort of uh, looked me up and down slowly and then said, they ask really difficult questions, you know. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is going to be terrible. I'm going to, you know, this is going to be I couldn't put two words together in public at that time. So I, I went to the beginning and I saw the sea of sommeliers and, and I, I grabbed a glass of Zinfandel to steady myself and I think said hello and proceeded to swirl the Zinfandel in the glass. And uh, I was shaking so badly that the wine actually flew out of the glass, um, starting from my head uh, and <laughs> did this beautiful wave to all the 
one. And I was wearing a cream colored turtleneck and a pale oh. yellow suit and pale cream colored stockings. And I literally got covered from head to toe with red wine. I thought, that's it. I'm dead. They're going to hate me. Um, for some reason, I actually made a joke. And, uh, and then they asked me difficult questions, which I could easily answer. And for some reason, it got a lot easier than that. I thought, you know, the worst thing that could have happened to me happened. And I survived. And so now people don't know that I'm painfully shy. I love it. That is such a good story. I know. <laughs> and I can just, I can see her looking you up and down, that look. And I, I, I used to get it in Florence when I walked into shoe stories. You know, I get these, <laughs> these women, you know, they look you up and down like, salve, buongiorno. I'm like, oh, girl, no, you didn't. You know, no, you didn't just look at me that way. <laughs> you know? oh, yeah. It was amazing. So oh. I think I followed that up actually with a vintner dinner at a um, wonderful uh, steakhouse. And it was my first vintner dinner in New York. And I, you know, I had on this, this red silk dress and I showed up and I looked at the, the room was a sea of gray. It was all shades of gray, but everybody was dressed in a gray suit and they were all men except for one woman in a gray suit. And here I was in my bright red dress from Napa Valley, California. So uh, anyway, I managed to get through that dinner as well, but I've always remember that uh, my, my first time in New York City selling wine. That was, that's, I think that's, that, I always say that's one of my favorites, but I think that is one of my favorites. I mean, the worst that happened, yeah. what's the worst could happen? I could spill wine all over my cream color outfit. Oh, oh, I just, I just did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then you can only go up from there. I mean, no wonder you probably were able to answer all the questions and really just, you know, nail it. And they were impressed. And you were like, yeah, because I've got nothing to lose now. <laughs> yeah, and I think until you sort of hit that, you know, what you feel is rock bottom, it's hard to get it together. But, you know, I guess my greatest fear was it's like as a performer, oh, my gosh, I might miss a note. Well, it took me a long time to figure this out, but apparently Franz Liszt's wrong notes were better than most people's right notes. And so I tried to take that to heart, and um, I think I have. Like, you know, if you just think that every note is a right note, as long as you believe it, so will everyone else. And if they know better, they'll be really impressed. That's true. And it's worked so far. And just like what your father says, I mean, do your best. And, you know, really, you got, we got to give ourselves, you know, a break sometimes and just say, do your best and, you know, trust that it will all work out. Absolutely. He was very right about that. And, you know, I was so upset at him for years because I really couldn't speak. I couldn't put two words together. And I thought, oh, why is he torturing me like this? But then after I got it, it's it's really changed my life. So I, I owe him a great deal. He used to, he said, I used to be shy too. And uh, I never believed it. And, you know, after, after I've had my experience now, I can truly believe that he was. And he overcame that and was able to succeed. And as he says, have a victory. Because he very much believes in having a victory every day. No matter what you've done, there's always a victory to be had. Oh, I love that. Nice. I think that's a great place to end our chat today. Have a victory. First of all, the Skype worked. <laughs> so that's, that's right. Victory. The Skype <laughs> worked. <laughs> it took a while, but we got it. <laughs> yeah. You've got a thing going on tonight too, right? Aren't you going to be? Mm -hmm. I'll be at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, which is really quite special. I uh, Grew up listening to uh, wonderful people speaking at the Commonwealth Club every Friday night at 8 o'clock, I believe, on KQED. So I'm really, really excited to, to actually be there and be a speaker there. Gosh, well, we will definitely let you get to it. And so listeners, if you're hearing this, uh, by the time you hear this, it'll be two days later. So you'll have missed it. But <laughs> Violet, could you let our listeners know where they can interact with you, whether in the social spaces online? What's the best way to reach out to you if they were so inclined? Well, uh, any way is possible. My email is violetta at gergich.com. That's V-I-O-L-E-T-T-A at G-R-G-I-C-H dot com. We have, we're on Facebook. Gergich Hills is on Facebook. So am I, but I'm not very active. And uh, I believe we're on Twitter as well. 
And uh, our website is gurgich.com, G-R-G-I-C-H.com. That should tell you everything you ever wanted to know about Gurdy Chills and especially how to come to the winery and visit, which is a fabulous place to visit, and buy some of our wines, which are truly incredible and life-changing. So I highly suggest everyone come to the winery. And if it's September and October, we're getting close to the end of October, we actually have grape stomping at the winery. And that's not by appointment. You can stop by anywhere from 10 to 4. Um, I would highly recommend not going on a Saturday afternoon because that's our busiest time. Um, but it's a great experience. My dad used to invite ladies to come to the winery and stomp grapes. And many, many years ago, a gal actually came to the winery and said, I'm here, Mike. I want to stomp grapes. And you're like, what do you mean? Well, you invited me to stomp grapes. So so we had to start grape stomping. And uh, we're really happy that we did because people get a great kick out of it. It's a wonderful way of really connecting and engaging um, with our environment, with grapes, with other people, with friends, learning our history, and uh, gives you a real appreciation of some of the basic nature of what wine really is, of how basic it is and you know, how incredibly complex. Wine is a wonderful thing, especially Gurga Chills wines. That is sounds so much like so much fun. I've never done the stomping. Oh my gosh. You gotta I come. know. I'm gonna have to go now. Well, we are going to let you go, Violet. Thank you so much and uh, good luck tonight and have fun at your speaking engagement. Thank you so very much. This was so much fun. Oh, it really was. appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll share all that information with our listeners, and we've even got your event posted to Facebook right now. So it's all it's all good to go, and you have a great rest of the week and a great harvest. Great. Thank you so much. You too. Bye-bye. Bye, Violet. Thanks, Violet. Well, that was really awesome. I really enjoy She's a happy person. No, I know. And I, I, when I sat next to her at, at lunch in Napa, I was like, she, I could easily just be best friends with this gal. I mean, she's so down to earth. She's lovely. She's just beautiful. She is. She's so beautiful. And we were all in like, you know, comfy attire, talking about what we love today, wine. So we were so fortunate to to get to uh, speak with Violet today. We hope you guys really, really enjoyed that. And uh, speaking of enjoying, you know what we enjoy? What? We enjoy when our listeners interact with us. And we have a speak pipe message from Yuan Jun, who is talking about the hashtag W25 challenge and her studies in France. Take a listen. So first of all, I would like to thank for Wine25 team for inviting me to join you guys. I'm going to briefly introduce myself. So my name is Yuan Jun, and I'm original from China. Basically speaking, I'm very passionate of wine. Uh, so I had to move to France in 2015. I'm currently locating Bordeaux. Meanwhile, I am conducting a wine master program. And that's how I met Lin Gaudi. And thanks for her, she introduced me to Wine to Five. And um, here I am. So for me, it is very simple to say that Wine to Five Challenge is a useful panel to absorb wine knowledge and uh, is a great idea for people who would like to share their wine experience as well. That is fantastico! <laughs> Okay, thanks for leaving us the message, Wan Jin. We're so glad you're enjoying the show and the hashtag W5 challenge and making new friends in France. So, uh, you know, guys, SpeakPipe is so super cool for our listeners, obviously, as you've heard. So feel free to drop us a message anytime. So, Val, let's move on to our Patreon love. Our show would not be possible without you, our listener community. To find out more about how you can support Wine to Five Show, please go to patreon.com, Wine to Five Podcast. We have another exclusive for our Uber fans on Patreon. So 
What Steph did is while she is hanging out in Italy, she's got a recipe for a Villa Nubo Ragu along with some photos. And this is Patreon exclusive content. So to see what she's cooking up in her little kitchen in Perugia, Italy, please check that out. And grazie mille to our P- Patreon supporters. You guys keep this show going. We have our tenacious tasters that are just as dedicated to our Wine to Five podcast as you are to your adult beverage, your wine, your beer, whatever else you enjoy. We appreciate your tenacity. And that is Jeff E. from the Hilarious Drinking Show, We Like Drinking. And to our It's Not Five O'Clock and We Don't Care listeners, you want your podcast when you want it and your wine when you want it. Nobody's going to tell you when it's time to pull that cork. So thank you to Meg from South Dakota. Thank you to Clay from Arizona and our newest patron, John from California. And Benito in Italiano. Yeah, she, yeah she's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That. Right now? <laughs> We hope that you will share Wine to Five with your friends in your online community. We certainly appreciate all your involvement and feedback. And please leave us a burning wine question or a comment like you just heard, and you could hear it on the show. We'd also love it if you'd go out to iTunes, show us some love there, inform, or wherever you catch your podcast, whether it's on iTunes or iHeartRadio, wherever it is, is. Give us a thumbs up, a glowing review. Help others discover our fun Wine to Five community. You can also check out our Facebook page. We got some fun posts there, including some information about our guest this week. We are on Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and even Google+. If you want to build your collection of wine books or accessories, because there are a whole bunch of them out there, please check out our online store, also located on our website. And you can connect with Val on Twitter at Wine Gal Unboxed and on the Vino with Val Facebook page and on Instagram as Vino with Val and you can find me on Twitter at Alborello Soap and on the Alborello Soap Facebook page and YouTube. And one more thing, don't forget about our hashtag W25 challenge so that will be going on through the end of the year. Keep trying new drinks. Be adventurous whether it's wine or otherwise and post it and put it out there and be a part of our challenge. So until next week, cheers Cheers, everybody. Salute. Salute. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO 5 and tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips.